All right. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight and taking an interest in this. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Edward Morristel. I'm the Chief of Police for Tunkhannock Township. I've been with the township since 2002. Uh, I've kind of worked my way through the ranks there. 2016, I became the chief. Um, that was when I first got introduced to ALERT, and I'll tell you what ALERT here is in, in a minute. Um, I went to a training, uh, an active shooter training as an officer, went through it, really, really liked what I saw, um, made the rest of my guys go through it as quick as we could, got lucky, an instructor spot opened up for that program, so I became a level one uh, ALERT instructor, which means I can go out and teach a two-day intensive course to police officers with a lot of force-on-force -force stuff. And that was really my introduction to ALERT. So what is ALERT? ALERT is Advanced Law Enforcement Rapid Response Training. Uh, it came about as an organization at Texas State University with a bunch of police organizations in the state of Texas. Unfortunately, they started after Columbine. Uh, we all know what happened in Columbine. At the time, police did everything the way they were taught to do. And unfortunately, a lot of people died. Uh, we realized our tactics weren't that good, everything was outdated, so we had to transition to uh, a more uh, aggressive response to these events. So uh, naturally, all these organizations popped up. Uh, sometime down the road with federal funding, the FBI was tasked with finding what they wanted the national standard for active shooter to be. And they, went, they, they researched everybody, they came up with the alert. That's what they wanted to use. So. Uh, now every FBI agent has to have that training. Like I said, I, I'm an instructor for it. Every one of my officers has it. Um, it's made for small departments for like us. It's made for small communities. Uh, you know, I might be the only person coming through a door because there's only a handful of police officers in this county. It's not made for SWAT teams. It's made for individual officers that are just going to have maybe me and a deputy sheriff and a guy from a neighboring town. Um, I realized pretty quickly that I was kind of behind the curve because the community was coming to me and asking me, hey, I want some active shooter training. And I didn't really have a, an idea for them. I put a lot of thought into my officers, never really thought about the community. So went ahead, got a, certified in this program. Uh, these two guys will introduce themselves shortly, got them uh, trained up on it, and now we push it out to you guys. I want you to know there is nothing in this program that is purely shock value. There shouldn't be anything that's going to jump out and be gory, scary. There's no strong language. Um, there are some videos with survivors, teachers, students that can be upsetting. I've given this program this I don't know how many times, and they still get to me. Okay, so if you need to step out, please step out. Um, we're not going to really do any questions with a group this size. Maybe at the end. If you want to ask something, you can. I'll be available. These guys will be available. You can come up if you don't want to ask it in front of the group. Um, and also, I would like to let you know that anybody here is representing like a business or anything, and you want this, you like what you see, I offer this for free to anybody in Wyoming County. It doesn't have to be Tunkhannock Township or Falls or Overfield, which is what we cover. I'll give this to anybody at any time. And that's thanks to my supervisors who agree with my vision, uh, Randy White, Kevin Banos, and Glenn Shoup. So if you see those guys, say thank you, because they're the ones that make this happen. Uh, also, uh, District Attorney Joe Peters had planned to be here tonight. He couldn't make it. He had a, another engagement in Philadelphia that he had to go to. So he sends his thanks and his support. And again, he's, he's a big part of this program for us, too. So uh, right now, I'll, I'll introduce Jeff Porter. Good evening. I'm Jeff Porter. I'm the 911 director here in Tunkhannock. I've been employed with them for about 19 years. I'm also a EMT with Pennsylvania, and Chief Morristel brought this uh, to me. We also had requests from the community looking for this type of training, so I was excited to partner with him. I think it's a great training, and I look forward to getting to it with everybody. And Rich Sieber. There you go. Thanks, Jeff. Everybody hear me? My name is Rich Seberg. For anybody that doesn't know me, just a little bit of background for me. I am a Marine Corps veteran. I am also a retired trooper after 22 years with the Pennsylvania State Police. And I have been, been employed with Tunkhannock Area School District for almost 15 years now as their director of security. So let's get right into this. I really, really appreciate the turnout that we have here tonight. And the whole idea, the objective is this, is to learn about active attackers, disaster response, and how to prepare for and respond to being trapped inside a building during an active attack or an event, 
Okay, we're also going to try to instruct you on how to assist law enforcement once they arrive on scene. So an active attack event. Okay, so a lot of times you hear that it's an active shooter, okay, but we're going to instruct tonight that it's an active attack event, and you'll learn why as we progress through this. But we're going to look at some of the research into these active attack events. So we have a definition. The federal government defines uh, active shooter events as one or more people actively engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a confined or populated area. So it's used to just uh, attempt to, for mass murders with a firearm for active ad attack events. Um, and the requirement is not that the attack actually wound up killing someone or shooting someone. It's that there was the actual event that occurred is going to be the definition. This data that we're going to show you here today is from the FBI, uh, from their study from 2014, but it does follow up through uh, today. All right, so let's discuss this a little bit here. The attacker. So is that our attacker? Not always. Like, they're showing you a picture up there, but there's really no set profile for a, an active attacker. They range in many different things. Now, I would say part of the profile is they are mostly male, but can be female. They come in all races and ranges of ages are increasing. So, I mean, I'm sure everyone saw the news several weeks ago that there was a first grade child that was a shooter. Okay, so it ranges from the very young to the very old. So we get into the, what we like to call the Avenger mindset. So when we say Avenger, like, this individual has a reason or a focus as to why he wants to commit this act. It's deliberate, it's focused, it's detached. He's some form of a bully, and many kill themselves when confronted with law enforcement. Some broadcast the event prior to some announce their intentions by posting on social media or talking to friends. I mean, probably most of us remember the Unabomber, okay, and his manifesto that had to get posted in the newspaper, okay? So that's part of that social media aspect to it. Okay, so risk factors. I think this is really important here. The previous slide discussed some of the uh, commonalities involved in the shooter and what we tend to look for. Um, but awareness and prevention is key to the success for intervention. Uh, and what I mean by that is, so for the school district here, I am the school threat assessment coordinator. And unfortunately, I probably average dealing with a threat assessment with something involved in the school district every week. So part of that is these topics here, these risk factors that I call precipitating factors. Okay, these, these are all factors that cumulatively, when you look at the threat assessment, gives you an evaluation. So is there a history of violence with this individual that you're looking at? Is there exposure to violence that created the history of violence? Okay, was it, were they exposed to it at a very young age? Uh, substance abuse and dependent 
dependency on that substance? Is that part of the risk factors and the precipitating factors? Mental illness. I'm sure you hear on the news all the time about mental illness when it comes to these active attacks. I truly believe that that is a big part of this. And most of the mental illnesses are not diagnosed, okay? So there are people walking around daily with undiagnosed uh, mental illnesses that really need our help and assistance. History of suicidal ideations. This is part of the process that we go through. So someone may have none of these, one of these, or all of these. And that is part of the threat assessment. But all of these accumulate into those precipitating factors that can create an active shooter situation. Some additional risk factors, which sometimes you'd think, eh, I don't know, you know. If you are stalking an area or stalking an individual, harassing, okay? Harassing is just annoying or alarming someone. That's all harassment is, okay? Or threatening behaviors. Does that individual get excited quickly? Right? Do they go from zero to 100 just like that? Negative family dynamics and support systems, right? That's part of that precipitating factors that we look at, right? Has this individual grown up in the type of family dynamic where there's no support and everything is negative? Do you become an isolationist? Are you unstable? And here's a big one that I think doesn't get used a lot is are others concerned, right? Are you gonna be that individual that speaks up and says something to law enforcement that, hey, I have some concerns about an individual. And, you know, I've talked to some of my family members and some people I know in the community, and they also have concerns, but we haven't said anything, okay? It's very hard for law enforcement to take action, proactive action on someone with these precipitating factors if they don't know about it. We'd much rather investigate something and have it turn out to be nothing than be reactive to an event that could have been stopped. So the next slide I'm gonna show here I believe is quite interesting. It starts in the year 2000. And as it goes through the process here, you're going to see that it's, it's the small dots are four victims or less, and the larger dots are greater than four. You'll also see through the color coding that there are guns, knives, and vehicles involved. One thing I want you to watch as this progresses from the year 2000 is how it starts to amp up as the years progress and the locations seem to jump up even more to the point where there, you can see some trends in the map. One, one year that I really want you to look at as it comes up here is the year 2017. And I want you to pay close attention to 2017 as it progresses through. And I'm gonna ask you the question at the end as to why 2017 uh, sticks in the memory of law enforcement. Are you guys thinking in your head how much, what this number is gonna be when it comes up? It's quite alarming when you see it. $4,000. 
464 active events in the United States. Now, why I brought up the year 2017 for this forum is if you look on the map in northeast Pennsylvania, you'll see that small dot. That's Tunkhannock, Pennsylvania right there. That was our active shooter events at, event at Weiss Market. Just something to reflect on as to one of the big reasons we're here tonight. Many believe schools are the most frequently attacked locations. It's always in the news, right? When something happens at a school, it makes the news. But when combined, businesses and other commercial locations actually account for about 50% of this. And that is why we are all here giving this training tonight, is that as a school district, we are extremely proactive in our approach to the safety of our students and staff. But when you're in the community, maybe you're a business owner, maybe you work at a business, maybe you're just in a parking lot somewhere, okay? We wanna give you this training and provide you educated information to make quality decisions in a very short amount of time that you're gonna have once you determine that one of these events is actually happening right where you are. So a lot of times shooters are connected if there is a direct relationship between the shooter and the attack. Now again, in the past week, we have seen that out in California at the uh, Asian Dance Club, right? The shooter was an allegedly a member there and was familiar with the people that were in there and was easy for him to get in there. So this accounts for a little bit more than half of these events. Just a quote. And I, I appreciate this quote because again, I mentioned 2017, okay? That was not that long ago lest we forget. The next slides I'm gonna show, we're gonna talk about things that have happened, that have made the news that you probably can remember. So you see Santa Barbara out in California. This was, this was an event of pure evil. The perpetrator killed three people independently by stabbing them at his residence and then eventually proceeding to attacking people with a gun on the campus of the university and then driving a car over them in the street. This is a prime example of why we have changed from calling this an active shooter event to an active attack event because it's not always with a handgun or a rifle. These attacks can be multi-pronged and it's an emerging trend. I'm sure you're very familiar with the name Pulse, the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida in 2016, the Pulse nightclub attack where an Islamic inspired terrorist attacked and killed 49 people. The shooter was connected to the nightclub in that he frequented this business as a patron. That was his only connection. The horrendous Las Vegas, Nevada shooting in 2017, uh, an individual attacked concert goers from an elevated position at the Mandalay Bay Hotel this shooter killed 59 people, making it the highest active shooter mass casualty incident in the United States since 
the use that we're going to teach you here tonight with avoid, deny, and defend is critical in a situation like this. Since we're in an open air environment, can they deny bullets from hitting them by seeking hard cover? And what I mean by hard cover, okay, in the military you learn about concealment and cover, okay? Concealment is where I'm hiding from the enemy. The enemy cannot see me, okay? But there is nothing to protect me there. It could be camouflage, right? That's cover. Concealment, especially hard concealment, when it comes to an assault weapon, handguns, anything like that, is a hard cover. Where I mean is concrete, cinder block, the engine block of a vehicle. Anything that would prevent that round from going through it is considered hard cover. And we'll use that as we go through the training here. New York City in 2017, I, I remember this vividly being on the newscast. A lone truck driver killed eight people and ran over 15 additional people in this rented Home Depot truck. That's where that multifaceted attack comes in. It can be a vehicle. And it can be numerous, numerous deaths and injuries. Sutherland Springs, Texas. One lone gunman killed 26 people and wounded 20 more. This person was a dishonorably discharged Air Force veteran. The shooting began in the exterior of the church, shooting into, and the attacker then moved into the church. Luckily, for some of the survivors, a witness retrieved their own weapon and began taking the fight to this individual, forcing him to flee the area, which I'm sure prevented additional losses of life. This one's very interesting to me. So the number of deaths in an incident is the product of two things. How long it takes for law enforcement to arrive on scene and target availability. What we are gonna teach you here tonight is that target availability and how to prevent that, okay? We train the police to get to the site as quick as possible. We are going to train you tonight to, to make your target less available. So how quick do police arrive on scene? Well, the nationwide average is three minutes. And you're like, wow, that's pretty fast, right? Not when somebody's shooting at you. Not when you're hiding and you're scared to death and you're thinking you're making that last phone call. And that's just the average, okay? A lot of my time in the Pennsylvania State Police was in rural areas. I was stationed in Bradford County, which is larger than the state of Rhode Island. And there might be two troopers on for that entire county. Now we're going as fast as we can to get to you, but it could be 30 or 40 minutes going 100 miles an hour to get to you. So target availability becomes very important, doesn't it? Where that avoid deny and defend that you're going to learn here tonight is critical. So three minutes is a great response time statistically, but that number can vary based upon a number of things such as traffic, which we discussed, 
other attacks. Maybe Chief is busy. He's already on a call, right? Location to the incident. I don't want to give you the false sense of security that three minutes will not be that long. Try holding your breath for three minutes. Okay? Try holding your breath when you're in fear of your life for three minutes. Try keeping quiet for three minutes behind a closed door when you're hearing gunshots. Chief? All right. Thank you, Rich. So just to go back to that three minutes, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but as a chief, as an administrator, if I could tell every victim that lived in my jurisdiction that I'm going to be there in three minutes or have an officer there, that would be fantastic. Again, absolute eternity. If you and I were to stare at each other for the next three minutes, it's going to feel like forever, right? And something's going to happen. Now, one thing that they don't put in this national average in an active event, especially when there's a firearm, somebody is being shot or killed every seven seconds. So how many people can we kill in three minutes? A lot, okay? So we're gonna get into some disaster response, the background science of how people behave in a high stress uh, event. Uh, the three stages of disaster response. So um, this was done by Amanda Ripley in 2008. Uh, it's a book called The Unthinkable, Who Survives When a Disaster Strikes and Why? Uh, Ripley did research examining who survives and who dies during disasters. She identified a three-phase process that everyone goes through during these events. People who survive go through the process faster and make better decisive actions uh, that have prepared ahead of time. So we have denial, deliberation, and a decisive moment. So we see this little cartoon. So we're gonna talk about social proof in the next uh, slide. We'll have a video for you. Uh, many people do not admit that there is a disaster or they underestimate the severity of a disaster. Uh, people delay taking action and that will cost lives. Um, in the World Trade Center, people called, the, uh, called others to check with them. They logged off their computers. Uh, they packed up their belongings before they evacuated. Why? Why would they do that? Uh, something that called the normalcy bias. Our brains are lazy. They look for shortcuts. If we took in every situation that happened and broke it down piece by piece, we wouldn't get anything done throughout the day. Our, from the time we start learning, and especially the administrators or the teachers in this room, you probably already know this stuff, our brains are looking for a shortcut. So the brain is lazy. It wants the f uh, things to fit into an existing plan. A lot of people haven't planned for this stuff. They don't know there's not a plan already pre-wired in their brain. Uh, it tries to define the disaster as something else that they're familiar with. Uh, for example, active shooter attack. Many people have described hearing the shots, but they attribute it to fireworks. All right. If you're here from a business, how many times have you heard fireworks inside your business? Right. How many times have we heard fireworks inside the school? Not saying it's not going to happen with some of the students we have, but it's probably not fireworks. It's something else. Like let's let's really think about what it is, and let's not assume that it's fireworks. Uh, that's just because that brain is trying to find that shortcut. Okay, that's what that was. I'm going to move on and get back to my task at hand. And the other thing is we are social animals. Um, we look to each other for clues about how to behave, especially the case when a situation is new to us. Uh, if you consider any time you might have been in a large formal dinner party, this is very true for me. You can ask my wife. She's hiding in the back back there. I'm not picking up a fork or a spoon until I see somebody else do it first because I don't know which one to pick up. Do I use this one? Do I use the big spoon, the little fork? I'm kind of seeing what everybody else is doing and I'll follow suit. I don't want to look out of place in that situation. We might do the same here. Oh, that was just fireworks. And now next thing you know, we have an active shooter coming through the door when that door could have been secured and locked down because we had already kind of mentally prepared. Something's not right here. Okay. So. This should Plays start like playing. Street okay. in New York City. If you were unfortunate enough to be the victim of a crime or taken ill unexpectedly, you might think that surrounded by all these people, someone would intervene. After all, isn't there safety in numbers? Psychologists say no. 
Research suggests that often a victim is less likely to receive assistance when surrounded by a group rather than a single bystander. When people are in a crowd, it's easier to pass the buck. It's what psychologists call the diffusion of responsibility. Liverpool Street Station in London, a busy thoroughfare for commuters. Uh, uh, Unknown to these uh, passers-by, Peter uh, is an actor. Uh, as part of an experiment on bystander apathy, he's pretending to be ill. Help. Help. Uh, How long before he gets help? Help. Help, please. Please help. Helping would be inconvenient or even risky. He lies there for more than 20 minutes and no one raises an eyebrow. Please, somebody help me. It's always very distressing to watch situations like this where people are obviously suffering and no one's actually helping them. But what we have here is two conflicting rules. One is the rule that we ought to help and the other is the rule that we ought to do what everybody else is doing. And here you have a, a group of, effectively a group of strangers who are exerting the pressure not to intervene, not to help. And it's very difficult to rebel. Ruth, another actor, takes Peter's place. How long before she receives help? Four minutes later, and 34 people have passed without stopping. Well, people don't really want to know that they just haven't got the time. Well, they have got the time, they just don't want to get involved. Unwittingly, these strangers have silently formed a temporary group with a rule, don't get involved. They're afraid to stand out from the crowd and won't take action if no one else does. This woman has clearly spotted Ruth, but she conforms to the rule and does nothing. Watch what happens, though, when someone else helps. Are you all right? You all right? Yes, thank you. Sure, you look a bit clicky, you know what I mean? She suddenly oh, finds oh. herself in a different group with a new rule to help. Uh, well, shut up. She... Well, she... uh, you all right? Yeah. Sure. First I thought she was dead. Then I saw, checked to see if she was breathing or not. And I looked around and I couldn't believe that no one had noticed her because there was a bloke sat there just absorbed in reading a newspaper. This time, Peter's dressed as a respectable gentleman. Now that his dress is in keeping with those around him, how long before he's rescued? Hello, sir. How are you today? I'm all right. Six actually. seconds. She name? even calls him sir, and suddenly, oh, everyone's a good Samaritan. Do you suffer from epilepsy? No. Why you're lying on the floor in the rain? Because he's part of the right group. Everyone wants to help. I would just hate to be in this position of feeling ill um, and nobody helping and walking past, so I'd just like to check that he was okay. And I thought, well, it's wet, so he must really be ill because he's going to ruin the suit anyway. <laughs> all right, so I think that kind of brings all those concepts together pretty nicely. You get a picture of what's going on, and we can probably all put ourselves, ourselves in a situation where we've seen something like that and decided not to act. And then, you know, we, we see it as officers all the time, you know, People drive past a car accident and find that one person that calls and stops, and the next thing you know, we have a, you know, we get there and there's a whole bunch of people. And people will tell us, like, man, I, I needed help, and I was trying to flag people down, and they were just driving by, driving by, driving by. One person stops, then everybody wants to jump in. Plays like this street. So deliberation. Uh, this next phase that uh, Ripley identified is one that people get to when they get past denial, they enter the deliberation phase. They understand something bad is happening. Now they have to decide what to do. Um, this is a problem because their brain is not functioning well of the effect of stress on the body. Additionally, this is where fear enters the equation because people now know this is a potential life and death situation. So we're gonna get into uh, the human brain versus the lizard brain. If you haven't heard these terms before, don't look at me strange. There's certain things that we've evolved over time to become, and there's certain things that are just still hardwired in us that we revert to when our heart rate and our stress goes through the roof, and we just revert to what is, in our lack of a better term, our programming. So the human brain is reflective. It is a thinking brain. It's flexible. It's rational, slow. You have to think about things. Uh, our lizard brain is reflexive, it's a reacting brain, it's fixed, emotional, fast, and things just happen. This is where like our fight, 
flight freeze comes in, all right? It's things that we don't really have a control over, they just happen and we can't explain why. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of stress response here with you. Um, so 60 beats per minute, this is when you are at your probably most relaxed. You've shut off for the day, kids are asleep, you've got your novel, you've got your beverage, you are happy, you're content. You know, the world is turned off for the day. You're very in a good place. Um, I want you to think about 90 beats when we're getting a little, this is getting a little bit more elevated. This is now something just made a noise at the screen behind your head or a screen in another room. You hear something at a window. Maybe it's windy outside, maybe it's a branch, maybe it's a person, we don't know, but our body naturally kind of just comes up. 120 beats per minute. Um, now it's really racing because we hear maybe, hey, that's not just a branch, that sounds like somebody trying to get in. Um, this is where our motor skills start to deteriorate, but peak physical performance is your gross motors uh, skills. So fighting, uh, stuff like that, you're not gonna have fine index touching or anything like that. Um, this is also, you know, you might have heard things like this with police officers um, in, a, in a, a shooting event. Sometimes an officer doesn't know he's been shot because there's no blood. And this is where our body pulls blood from our extremities and sends it to our core because that's where it's needed most. It's needed most here to protect our organs. Uh, it goes to our brain, things of that matter. 150 beats per minute, uh, condition gray. This is where cognitive processing really deteriorates. This is where tunnel vision comes in. If there's anybody in here who's like a deer hunter and you've shot a deer without ear protection, you probably didn't even hear the rifle go off. That's called auditory exclusion. Again, all of that has been pulled away to focus on what we're seeing and that's where that tunnel vision comes in. Um, this would be where now that you heard that noise, now you look in the other room and you see somebody coming through the window, you realize this is really bad. And in a 175 beats condition black, Complete system overload, this is where you're gonna freeze, this is where you're gonna uh, avoid your, your bowels, your bladder, it's a totally involuntary thing. You cannot operate here, no, you know, unless you're an elite athlete, you cannot operate at 175 beats per minute, condition black. So we're gonna play another video here on stress response. What I want you to notice, um, there's going to be a mother with a child in a car, in a stroller, I'm sorry, and that mother has probably taken that child in and out of that stroller God knows how many times. I've done it with my children. It's something we could do super simple. Uh, in this event, it's, a, it's an active event. I want you to see how she struggles with just a normal everyday thing she's probably done a thousand times. So going back to our stress response, why did that happen? She has no fine motor skills. Her heart rate is through the roof. She's relying now on gross motor skills. She can't open that little clasp. She's resorted to just, I'm gonna physically rip this baby out of this carrier. So, all right. so this is the floor plan for the station nightclub. Uh, I want you to take notice there's four exits that are labeled. This will be another video. Uh, this is a video you might find disturbing. Uh, I forget the year on this one. I believe it was White Snake was playing. They overloaded their pyrotechnics. They caught the roof of the building on fire. You're going to see that in this video. You're gonna see how long it takes for people to realize like, hey, the roof is on fire. This is not part of the show. But again, nobody's moving. Social proofing, normalcy bias, everybody just kind of hangs out. So again, this video can get a, a little intense. It's, it's nothing terrible, but for the younger ones in the room, just. Just be aware of that.
This shows the social proofing in action, right? A lot of denial there, a lot of time went by. These people only know the entrance that they came in as an exit. So if I asked everybody right now, excluding the way you came into this room without looking around, do you know another way out? Yeah, so you guys probably took notice of that. Good, you came to this training, you're forward thinking. So what I expect for people that come to a training like this. And that's, you know, a, a lot of this probably could have been prevented with Station Nightclub had they looked to see where those other exits were. Uh, there was windows that could have been smashed out, things of that nature. So take a look around on this. Each one of the yellow circles represents a body found at that location with the total number of bodies in white for that area. Uh, the number of dead in the exit hallway, the main entrance was 31 people. Initially, there was no panic. People were still able to use their human brain to process a proper response to get out. Once the primary entrance was clogged and inaccessible, panic set in and people reverted to their lizard brain. The only thing they were thinking was to get out. When they were able to think rationally, they knew there would be more than one exit besides the one they used to enter. However, under stress and relying solely on the lizard brain, they could think was to flee to the door through which they had entered. When the human brain shuts down, the lizard brain takes over and provides very few options if not properly prepared ahead of time. So this is a little grainy of a photo. It's much better on the computer. I know you can make out a person there. That is the people hanging out the front door that were trapped in that front hallway. Just that whole exit was clogged. And if we go back to that other slide, there was people that had ran back to the kitchens, like areas where there was absolutely no way out. They ran to bathrooms. Um, had they paid attention going into there, there was an extra exit outside of the bar. The whole front had windows that could have been smashed to get out. But when we're running super high uh, in the black, there's, you know, you're just not gonna think properly. So in this deliberation phase, uh, you wanna keep your human brain running as long as possible. And these are just gonna be some really simple techniques. Um, obviously, uh, you wanna tell yourself to calm down. Just a simple technique, telling yourself to calm down can help breathe slowly through your nose um, for two seconds breathe out through your mouth and then hold it at the bottom for two seconds and that can slow your heart rate by 20 to 30 seconds it could put you back down two conditions from where you were so if you're running into black now you're running back into red and we know what we talked about we're running into red okay we don't have fine dexterity but that's where we like to fight that's that's a good place for us I know it sounds silly talking about breathing I'm in an instructor class all this week and that was a lesson that we hit. It's one of the blocks I have to tell police officers if I do make it through the rest of this class is there's a whole section on just breathing. Seems silly, but it works, you know. Shifting your emotions. Um, I expect people to be scared. There's situations I've been in I was scared. Uh, we can't let that dictate how we're going to do, uh, get out of this situation. Uh, what I like to tell a lot of people, especially you know, in a school where I've given a lot of these trainings, is this is where you need to get angry, all right? This coward has now come into your house, your classroom, your church, your business, right? That shouldn't happen, right? You need to take your fear and make it anger. There's no such thing as a fair fight in an active shooter event or an active event. You do what you have to do to survive. Um, and then fourth, stay fit. Easier said than done, we're all busy. I lost my cursor here, so give me a second. I have no idea where it is. So um, this is something we talk a lot with new police officers, scripting and practice. Sometimes in Tunkank, there's not a lot going on in the middle of the night, and I'll tell the guys, go drive around, go look at a bank parking lot, sit there. What would you do if you were on day shift and that got, the alarm goes off? Have a plan. If you're in a classroom, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna secure your door? What are you gonna do with your students? You can't find it either, huh? It's over here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I think it's still on there, but I can't get it to come down onto it. There it is. Nope. Good luck with that, I can't find it. I think if you click this, it'll just keep Yeah, going. okay. So, show of hands, anybody know Rick Riscorla? All right, one, that's usually better than, <laughs> all right. No, I definitely need the cursor for a couple of these things if we could figure this out. I apologize. It's not on the screen, so we have a tech person here. I know it's there, it's not here. You just hit the left arrow was back. I need right to be able to scroll. Oh, yeah. oh, there it is. Okay, we're back. 
All right, that's probably a little hard to read. Uh, Rick worked for Morgan Stanley Dean Witter in the World Trade Center, right? He was there for, since 1993 when the original bombing happened. Prior to that, he was a British Special, uh, special Forces guy, real bad dude, seen a lot of action, real squared away type of guy. Uh, when he went into the public sector to become private security, he knew the 1993 failed attempted bombing at the World Trade Center was not going to be the end of it. So he became obsessive with his training in his security position for that whole company. Um, he would drill them all the time. He was known for if there was like big wigs coming into town and there was a big board meeting, boom, active, active event training right in the middle of that. You know, get everybody scattered out kept his job, but that was part of his mentality. He's like, we need to be prepared for this. They're coming back. So I don't know if you can read um, what's on the stone there, but in 1993, Rick was the vice president of corporate security for Dean Witter Morgan Stanley Company when the World Trade Center was bombed for the first time. He led the evacuation that day, stayed in the smoldering building for 12 hours helping firefighters. Uh, after the terrorist attacks on 9-11-2001, Rick Scorla again led the evacuation of the World Trade Center he was last seen going upstairs into the burning building, conducting a final sweep for survivors. He was killed when the South Tower collapsed. He's credited with saving 2,700 lives. So that's what I think when I, that's why I think I, that's the level that I want when I'm training this. That's what I want you guys to be at. Just think about this stuff. Nobody wants to admit it. It, it does happen here. We saw with the Weiss market, we don't want to be caught without a plan. All right, so I'll just give you the little readdown on this on Decisive Moment. Spencer Stone, Alex Scarlatos, and Anthony Sadler story, these men fought through fear and moved to the decisive moments to defend not only themselves but others on a train. Moving through denial into action requires commitment to oneself as to others that are depending on you to lead. Little less than a month ago, three childhood friends were on a train bound for Paris when they heard a gunshot. Amid screams and commotion of the passengers, they quickly focused on a man wielding an AK-47. Almost instantly, one of them said, let's go, and the three ran toward the shooter. Those three friends are with us here today. Thank you, Alec, Spencer, and Anthony, for what you did on that train and for joining us here. And that's because after Alex said, let's go, he and Spencer and Anthony sprinted toward the gunman while he trained his rifle on them. Spencer tackled the assailant and the three worked to disarm him. As we know, Spencer was stabbed in that effort. After they knocked out the gunman, they tended to other injured on board before paramedics and police arrived. Little less. Okay, so we're going to get into a little bit of the civilian response. We'll look at specifically the uh, response options we have for civilians to remember, reference, then back to Ripley's three phase disaster response. So don't deny if you hear gunshots. Go to deliberation. If you hear gunshots or something that could be gunshots, go to the straight to the deliberation phase. Often we hear an event, a, vic a victim or a witness states it sounded like fireworks. We talked about this already. Ask yourself how often do you hear fireworks at work? If you weren't paying attention, you're paying attention now, I guess. What did you just hear? Gunshots, not fireworks, right? That's where we would just jump out of denial and move right forward. Not my favorite slide in this presentation. I apologize, I didn't make it. So playing dead, we'll have a video about why playing dead doesn't work as a strategy. Uh, Christina Anderson was in room 211 at Virginia Tech. She played dead and she was shot a total of three times. Once the shooter first attacked and then twice more came back to that room. Playing dead is not a good strategy. We heard the first shots at around 9.40 a.m. Uh, I was sitting on the wall of the classroom, so in the hallway, and I could hear 
the shots getting closer and closer very quickly. I mean, there was only a few seconds between the first time we heard them and when he actually walked in. To me, it sounded like um, an ax being taken to a piece of wood. And our teacher, she opened the door and she peered outside and she immediately shut the door and she said, call 911. And right then, he walked in just seconds after. Um, there's absolutely no time to to think or to duck or to take cover and people just kind of fell to the floor and he immediately walked in shooting and he went to the other side of the classroom and he started going down the rows. He went down each row very quickly, very purposefully and I remember thinking your, your turn is coming, you're going to get shot. I mean I didn't realize there was an active shooter but I knew something bad was happening. He came back to our classroom three times and on the third time he killed himself in the front of the class. In between each time he was there, you could just hear people crying and coughing and the cell phone started ringing. Um, when he was in our class, I remember trying not to breathe very much, so he couldn't tell I was alive. Because as my stomach was hitting the, the chair, I was thinking, you know, he can see me breathing, he can see me alive, and, and that was very scary. I'll never forget when the SWAT team first broke in um, at around 9.51. The officer in the front of the classroom said, we have a lot of blacks in here. And at the time, I couldn't comprehend what he was talking about, but he met triage codes. And I remember looking into the girl to my right and realizing you know, what black meant. He looked over me and he said, First he said yellow, and then he changed it immediately, and he said red, and that's when I first started panicking. I still couldn't speak. I was shot three times, lying on my back, and I remember thinking, what do you see? Like, what can you see on me that I can't, that you would change me from yellow to red? He killed 12 people in my classroom, including our teacher. Sorry, let me go back a phase there. So hide and hope, uh, the first thing you are hiding behind is probably not bulletproof. Rich talked on this earlier. There's very, very few things in common construction in the United States that will stop a bullet. And the second thing is what happens when you're found, right? There's, you're not going anywhere. So I'm just gonna put all three of these up at once. We've heard of run, hide, fight. Alert teaches something called avoid, deny, defend. Like we need another acronym. Everybody's like, why is this, why are they putting a spin on something else that we probably already know? There's a couple reasons. Um, I look around the room, if I tell everybody to run, pretty confident most people in here probably could, not everybody can. If I go to one of our senior living care centers and say, okay, what well, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to run, and everybody's bedridden, what good is that training, right? The other thing is we've had that beat down our heads so many times, run, run, run. Well, run, run where, right? We just don't want people running indiscriminately everywhere, right? That's where avoid comes in. We want to avoid that disaster area. We want to avoid where those shots are coming from. If they're coming from that side of the building, let's get to that side of the building. Deny goes with, with hide, exactly. We want to deny that person instead of hiding behind a desk or hiding in a closet, I, wanted, I can't run, I can't go, I'm kind of pinned down to this room, I need to deny them coming in here. So I'm gonna take some actions. Um, this school year, we gave this to all the teachers, we went around, showed it to some of their classrooms, and we showed them you know, inward opening doors, outward opening doors. The outward opening doors, you know, there's a lot of options you could put a, you'll see, we'll, we'll get into a slide here later. You can wrap a belt around that and hold it to the side. Something to slow that down. Remember, they're looking for target availability. If somebody gets to a door that they have to work on, they're gonna bypass it because they want to be the next superstar of the active shooter world and they want the most kills and they want to be remembered in the paper that way. All right? If they have to mess around with the door, they know we're coming. We're coming and we're putting them on the ground. Like there's, there's no two ways about that. So they're not gonna waste time. They wanna get that target availability. So we wanna deny them getting that. And again, we'll get down to the bottom one, fight versus defend. Again, I don't claim to be the strongest guy in the world, but if I pick a little kid and I tell them to come up here and fight me the way I stand, I don't think they're gonna feel very confident about that. I tell them to defend themselves, but you know, that changes the mindset. Maybe they'll think about picking something up and clocking me in the head with it. Maybe they'll throw a rock at me. They'll hit me in the head with something. 
that's that's where that mindset kind of comes in. So it's just a little little tweak there. Uh, we like avoid deny defend. We think it's more inclusive. I think it covers some more situations and it gets your mindset kind of right on how to handle some of these things. So next we're going to show a school board meeting. Um, we'll show a video. This is 2010 Panama City School Board meeting. Um, be aware if something. This is a big one for if something looks wrong and feels wrong, leave. Right. So watch the reactions of the people seated in the audience when the suspect first pulls a gun. They are clearly in denial and fail to make immediate action. They grab their handbags or jackets. Um, watch the attempt of uh, somebody trying to disarm the attacker. It's a good idea. Uh, it's nice to do something that's commendable, but without sufficient practice, training, or preparation, that action will not have the desired outcome. There's a difference between having the right to defend yourself and the ability to do so. All right, so we'll play this for you. For the technology to notice it's on the uh, chart that you have there, and it's part of the plan that we have that the workshop we're going to have to follow this meeting. But uh, this will be the first step in that whole process. I have a motion. Oh, I motion to everybody in this room. Okay, so you see a lot there. You don't see him spray painting. There's a, there's a lead up to that, but I would say if we're in a school board meeting and somebody comes in and starts spray painting V for Vendetta on the wall, we get out as soon as possible. He tells everybody to get out other than the school board, and they're just sitting in the stands watching. Again, denial. This is obviously not part of an act or anything like that. Something is about to go wrong. Uh, we see the failed attempt from the lady that comes out from the back room that whacks him with the purse and really doesn't do too much. Thank God she's still alive. Um, again, commendable, but how realistic was that, that that was going to disarm that guy? So avoid, so you leave ASAP, know your exits, call 911. We'll have another video coming up. Um, let's see. All right. So if you watch that video, I'll play it a second time. It's pretty short. I'm sure everybody saw the guy with the gun go in the front door, right? Pretty obvious. How about the guy in the car? I'm out of here. Immediately sees it's wrong, bypasses denial, guy shouldn't be going into the store with a gun, gone. So this one looks pr pretty clear. I think my cursor's in a different spot than you guys, but you see the two people crouched by the door, right? So this was that same incident. This was a Jewish deli in, I forget the location. It was overseas somewhere. They ran to this back room. What is right above their head? Crash bar for an emergency exit. They're hunkered down. Okay, say that's locked. What's right next to them? A ladder to the roof. The door is still open. So don't just limit yourself to doors. Think beyond that. If you have windows available, I mean, you might find a second or a third floor. Maybe that's not going to work, but use them if you can. So deny, lock the door, lights out, out of sight. So if we go back, all right. So we can't get out, we can't use the roof, we can't use the door. What else could we have used? There's some tarping that we could hide under. We could have barricaded that door with all these heavy racks that we see over here. Just leaving that door open hiding in that corner, probably not the best idea. 
but again, we're running really high in our stress response and it seemed like the best idea at the time. So some considerations for barricades, right? Heavier, better, more, better, doorstop, better. This was presented to us again. A lot of the schools have those outward opening doors. Say you don't have something to secure it with, pile a bunch of stuff in front of it. And I know you're gonna say, well, they're just gonna open the door. It's an outward opening door. What's a big pile of stuff gonna do? Well, is that person gonna wanna fight through desks and chairs and all kinds of stuff to get to, who knows if there's anybody, how many people are even in that room? Maybe it's one person, maybe he wants more targets. Not gonna mess, mess around with that. So if you can pile all kinds of stuff there, please, by all means, consider doing that. And then we're back to this slide, just talking about what I talked about, using that tarp for cover, using those racks to barricade the door. Simple door stops. I carry what's called a go bag. It's, it's made for situations that, God forbid, they ever happen for one of these. I keep wooden door stops with me. It's a great way to secure a door. You kick one under a door. It's a good way if the door's already closed to make sure nobody comes out of that room. They're fantastic. Um, so obviously, something as simple as that you could have and it could help make a big difference with securing the door. This is what I talked about before with ropes and tension sleeves. I know we showed a technique to the middle school teachers uh, this summer. They have very small chairs in their room. There's a way you could take that chair and position it over that door handle against the door frame. And we went outside and pulled on one. Uh, we may or may not have damaged the door frame in the process, but it, it's very strong, all right? It's very strong. So, but we tried it and we showed them it worked and everybody's, you know, their eyes lit up like, wow, what a simple, easy idea, you know? And then commercially, there's all kinds of stuff out there. You can research that. Uh, I can't recommend anything right now under the guise of Tunkhannock Township Police. If you catch me as Ed Morris still on the street, I'd be glad to talk to you about that stuff. So we're gonna watch a video now of Caitlin Rogue. She was a school teacher at Sandy Hook. Uh, she was able to save kids in her room. Very compelling interview. As you can already hear the inflection from my voice, I, this one gets me every time. Uh, her pers pers perspective as a teacher and what she did um, is, is absolutely amazing. So sit back and check this out. That all day we have met people who remind us what teachers do, how much they care even in the face of terror. And I sat down with a first grade teacher at that school, Caitlin Roick. She heard gunfire, large windows exposed her classroom. So she managed to rush 15 small children into a tiny bathroom to try to save their lives. I put one of, one of my students on top of the um, toilet. Just, I just knew we had to get in there. I was just telling them it's gonna be okay, uh, you're gonna be all right. I, I pulled the bookshelf before I closed the door in front of it. So it was completely, we were completely barricaded in. I turned the lights off. Did you tell them to be quiet? Did you oh, yes. worry about one of them? No, I told them, I told them to be quiet. I told them we had to be absolutely quiet um, because I was just so afraid that if he did come in and then he would hear us and then he would maybe just start shooting the door. So I said, no, we just have to be absolutely quiet. Um, and we have, I said, there are bad guys out there now. We need to wait for the good guys. And I'm like, yeah. I, I, I just, I wanted us to be okay. And I'm so, so saddened that there are people who, who in this situation are not okay. Um, and my heart, my heart goes out to anyone who knew them and was part of their lives. I, can't, I just can't imagine. Did they cry? No, if they started crying, I would like take their face and say, it's gonna be okay, show me your smile. Like I really tried to like, you know, and one of my students was, you know, would say like things like, I know karate, so it's okay, I'll lead the way out. Like, they really said to you, we wanna go home for Christmas. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I just wanna hug my mom or just, you know, things like that that were just, just heartbreaking, you know? And like in my mind, I mean, cause you're hearing, I've never been a part of something, obviously, anywhere near this traumatic. Um, and so I'm hearing the gunfire in the hallway, and I'm thinking in my mind, I, I'm the first classroom. Why isn't he coming? You know, I'm thinking, we're next. And, you know, and in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, as, as a six-year-old, seven-year-old, what, what are your thoughts? What are your, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking that I have to, to almost be their parent. Like, I have to tell them, you know. So I said to them, I said, I need you to know that I love you all very much and that it's going to be okay because I thought that was the last thing they were ever gonna hear. I thought we were all gonna die. Um, 
you know, and I don't know if that's okay, you know, teachers and, you know, but I wanted them to know someone loved them and I wanted them, that to be one of the last things they heard. Uh, not, not the gunfire in the hallway. Uh, it's just so horrible, it's so horrible, horrible, horrible. Um, How did you know you were gonna be okay? What happened? I didn't. Um, what finally happened was the gunfire stopped. The gunfire wasn't um, that long, um, so that stopped, but I, st I said, no, we're not going anywhere. We're staying right. here um, until someone good comes in, uh, sorry, gets us out. So eventually what happened was the police came and started knocking, um, and obviously, I mean, I was completely beside myself, and I said, I don't, I don't believe you. Um, you need to put your badges under the door. Um, so they put their badges under the door. I said, if you're really a police officer, then you would have a way to get in here. You would have a key, or you would have gotten it from the janitor. If everything's okay now, you would have found the keys. So he had the keys, and he found the right one, and he unlocked the door, and then they brought us out to the um, firehouse to meet up with the rest of um, the teachers and students, waiting for parents to come and pick them up. <sighs> I think there are a lot of people who wish now, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but every one of us in this room should know who she is because she's an absolute hero. So we'll move to defend. Uh, when dealing with civilians, many will not have combat mindset. It's something that we as police officers talk about all the time and train for. Uh, I need to fully understand the gravity of the situation when dealing with uh, a person that's determined on killing people. So your positioning, uh, you can grab a gun, fight, and this is what I talked about earlier where you shift your emotions. You're going to be angry, uh, you're going to be scared, there's going to be a lot of fear, but that's where you really have to take that anger and take it on the offensive and take this person out. Um, they're not expecting resistance. They're not expecting a gun to be grabbed. On either side of a door like that, you grab a gun. Uh, what we talked about uh, with some of the teachers this year is in, in what we call in the police world, there's always a deep corner of a room. It's what we can't see when we do what's called a threshold evaluation. I can see 90% of a room before I go in there by the way I do, uh, address an open door, but I can never see that one corner. And that's why I told him like, this is where you should be stacking up in that deep corner of that room. And then you have your people positioned by the door because that way if somebody comes through with a gun, you grab it, you can aim it where you want it if it accidentally goes off and then you fight with it. Um, and this is where I tell people, Everything you know about a fair fight goes out the window. All the places you were told not to punch somebody or grab them or do or bite or do, whatever you have to do, this is life and death, this is survival. You have to do what you have to do. Um, there's a lot of easy things you could have. Uh, you know, we recommended some things to the school district, you know, teachers, if the school would allow them to have it. Businesses, I tell them, you know, if you don't, obviously not everybody wants the guns around, but have a baseball bat. It's reasonable to have a baseball bat in an office, right? A golf club. Uh, years ago, somewhere in Pennsylvania here, there was a teacher, he took some criticism, but he had a bucket of rocks, right? Seems like a silly idea. You ever been hit in the head with a rock? I have. It's not fun. It really, really hurts, right? You get a room of people throwing rocks at somebody, they're not expecting resistance. They, they think they are that superior power coming in there and they're, they're fulfilling their, their uh, sick vision, for lack of a better term. So uh, we're going to have another short video here. You'll see this gentleman, he's looking for alternatives uh, to use as a weapon to defend himself. And then I want you to watch at the end of this aisle, uh, there's a lady and you'll just check out what she does and we'll talk about more about that. All right, so we saw the first guy, he grabs a bottle of wine. It's all he's got around him. I don't want to get hit in the head with a bottle of wine. Ultimately, he saw an avenue for him to escape and he got out of there. But he was thinking, I'm going to grab this and this is what I'm going to use to defend myself with. Then we see the lady at the end of the aisle. Nobody was shot in that part of the building. She's playing dead. This is why we talk about playing dead is not a good idea. That guy is going to walk around, know he hasn't shot anybody there, and now there's an easy target for him. Okay. Probably seemed like a good idea at the time, but watching the video, obviously, we know it's, it's not. A little quote from uh, Lieutenant Brian Murphy, if you want to read that. He was a police officer. He responded to, oh gosh, I've forgotten this one. I think it was a synagogue. I think he was in Minnesota. He was shot 16 times. 
You know, it's a really interesting story if you read about it, but he kept in the fight the best he could, and all he had left at one point is he was laying sideways looking under a car and giving radio communications to guys that were responding. That was his mindset, right? He took that fear, he turned it into anger. He wasn't going out on that guy's terms. He's going out on his terms. So surroundings, we talked about avoid, deny, defend. You check your environment, the room that we're presenting in. Usually we would break down if this was a smaller group and come with ideas. What we need to understand with a room this size, if a threat presented itself right now, right there, we're all not gonna have the same response in this room. We can't. Everybody over here is probably gonna be tasked with going immediately to fight, right? Or uh, defend, I'm sorry. You're gonna have to defend. Over here, you might have some time to get away, right? You might be able to get out one of these other exits. In a small room, you're gonna, what I want you to understand is this is not a, uh, it's not an order of events. We're not gonna move through it. Like if somebody came through right now where Jeff is standing, right over here, this is gonna be a defense situation. You folks in the back, avoid, I'm out of here, right? And simply stated, what you do matters. So this is a quick little flow chart. So I'll just put them all up there. So attack starts, primary exits, yes. I'll just put them all up there, it's easier. So attack starts, primary exits, we have them, avoid, run, no, deny or defend. Are there other exits? No, fight, other exits, yes. Back to avoid, it's a pretty simple concept, like I said, something happens right here immediately, you folks are gonna have to get on the offensive there. We're gonna talk a little bit about Virginia Tech. Look at Norris Hall, and a case study of uh, different responses and how everything turned out there. This is the second floor. So, these are the rooms, take notice of them. We'll come back to them a couple times. Um, the suspect had killed two students earlier in the morning, which led to a very large police presence at Norris Hall. Uh, the suspect first entered room 206, then 207, then 211. Every single person in room 211 was shot with 11 killed and six wounded. This was the third room attacked and was revisited by the suspect two more times. Room 204, was Professor Labrescu's room. Uh, he held the door closed while 10 of his students escaped. Uh, the professor and another student were killed and four were wounded, however. Uh, he was shot through the door, basically holding the door closed, but he, his delaying allowed uh, everybody else to exit through the window. Room 205 was a complete denial with students lying on the floor and putting their feet against the door, holding it closed. While the suspect did shoot through the door, he didn't hit anybody. So, we could figure out red equals dead, yellow is injured, green is alive. So you can see the rooms that had a plan, the rooms that didn't have a plan, and you know, look at the survivors versus the casualties. You know, you had the professor closing holding the door closed in room 204. Unfortunately, he was killed with another when he was shot, but you know, he's credited with saving those 10 people, plus the wounded. Uh, room 205, they got down on the floor, laid down, even though he shot through, he was shooting over them. They held the door closed with their feet. Room 211, like I said be earlier, that's the, that's the interview we saw uh, with that one girl. That room was revisited three times. So the room, the shooting started at room 206. The shooter walked in, started killing people. He left and returned later to shoot more people. 211, the teacher heard the shots, uh, told the students to call 911. Students attempted to block the door with a desk. The shooter pushed through it, shot the professor, walked down the aisle killing students. The shooter returned, later shot more students. Room 207, the second room attacked. The shooter walked in, shot several students and a teacher. He then walked down the aisle shooting students. The shooter then left. He attempted to return. Students used their bodies to barricade the door. The shooter got one inch open. He also fired several shots into the doorknob area. No one was hit. 204, uh, Professor Labrescu, Labrescu, 
He was a Holocaust survivor. He held the door shut when the, sh the shooter tried to enter. He yelled to his students to jump out the window. Now the shooter shot him through the door, killing him. 10 students made it out the window before the shooter got in. Two more were shot trying to get out. They both survived. The six who did not get out, four were shot and one of those died. And room 205, the students heard the shots, used their feet to keep the door closed. The shooter pushed on and fired through the door and no one gained it. He didn't gain entry. So playing dead and hiding, obviously not good strategy. And this kind of breaks down why they don't work. So when the police arrive, so you want to follow our commands. We don't know who is friend or foe. We might have very limited information. We might not have a suspect description when we're coming there yet. Uh, we want to see your hands. We don't want to see any crazy movements or, you know, just kind of follow what we're telling you. Uh, we're stressed too. We're scared. There's, we're going through all these same emotions. So uh, in the process of this, you might be handcuffed. Just go with it, right? Not pleasant, but it's not the end of the world. Go with it. We'll deal with it later. We'll straighten it out. Uh, if you weren't meant to be handcuffed, we'll get you out of them. But if that's what happens, don't fight us. Let us kind of do our job. And the law enforcement focus is stop the killing, stop the dying, and evacuate the injured. So I tell this to people, and they, a lot of times they kind of they look at me a little funny, is if we come into the building, even if I come in with my three best friends, the guys I trust the most, and we're going down the hallway, and we see injured students, injured people, we are going to bypass them, and you need to understand why. We are going to walk right over that person, and we're going to move to our threat and put that person down. Uh, as much as I told you guys I don't want you in a fair fight, I don't want to be in a fair gunfight where it's mano a mano with another guy. I want my friends with me. We he need to go in there uh, and put this individual down with force. Our immediate threat is to stop that killing. Like I said earlier, every seven seconds, somebody is being shot. After we've done that, that's when we'll stop, uh, we'll transition to stop the dying. That's where we'll go back and we'll start administering aid to people we saw. Um, you might not be able to see it. I'll step aside here. Right here, this is a tourniquet. When I started my career, tourniquet was a dirty word. You didn't talk about it, you didn't think about it, you didn't even, you didn't even, it was not part of our training at all. Now, they give us these things all the time. I mean, I've got them all over my house because I've gotten so many free ones. I've got them in every car, I've got them in my hiking backpack, my wife thinks I'm nuts, they're everywhere. Why? Because of the war in Afghanistan with IEDs. We realized with what the military was doing to save a lot of these guys and save some of their limbs and you know not have them die out. We can effectively use tourniquets. The, the technology is caught up, so we get a lot of training on them. Now we carry quick clot, which is a, a, an agent to stop uh, bleeding quickly. And then obviously then we'll start working on evacuating the injured. Another thing you under, need to understand is an ambulance crew is not coming into this building until we deem it completely safe. This high school, for us to say it's clear, would take us a day. It's not just a cursory, quick little go through I mean we got to go through every nook and cranny and then once you leave that you have to post somebody there because the second you don't put an officer there and go to somewhere else that room could be infiltrated so for us to clear a building this size it's going to take forever the EMS crew is not coming in so at some point we're going to have to start moving our injured and we do what's called a casualty collection point we might pick a classroom or the auditorium where we'll start bringing our injured we're not supposed to use the triage word because we're not medical professionals but I'm going to use it anyway we'll start assessing you know who needs immediate who needs immediate help if i've got a tourniquet on a guy and it's controlled bleeding and somebody with a sucking chest wound the guy with the sucking chest wound is going first and we'll kind of figure that out if you've got a broken ankle you're staying i'm sure you want to get out of here and people will do that they'll try to get to an ambulance as quick as possible because they don't want to be in here but we'll kind of we'll take care of that so there's another little video coming on what to expect when police arrive you're going to see a really professional officer really calm calculated and he's just kind of telling everybody what to do and in, in, in a professional manner If you're not cool, I'm not walking it, dude. Sir? Trust me, trust me. You walk to that deputy, you're keep your hands right and see him. I'm always that deputy. So you're going to make a left of the deputy's out. Thank you. Thank you. Try to relax, everyone. Try to relax. I'll take a bullet before you do. That's for damn sure. Just be cool, okay? So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Porter. He's our EMT. He talks a little bit more about the medical. So Chief took a little bit of my thunder here, but EMS is going to stage. They're not going to go into the hot zone. 
at the point that the active threat is still going on. So we're going to have everybody staging out, also from like the 911 standpoint, to touch base. You know, everybody says, all right, call 911. Call 911 when it's safe to do so. Try to, try to get to a place that you can get away from it. If you dial the phone and just let it connect, if you can't talk, we can listen to the background audio. We'll have a location of that. That's something else we can do. But if you can get yourself safe, that's what you want to do first. Um, EMS will be there. They'll be staging. And as soon as they can, uh, they get the clear sign. They're going to be coming in and treating those patients, moving them out, and taking them to the healthcare facilities. So there's a, a class. Anyone in here familiar with Stop the Bleed? Has anyone taken that before? So it's a free training. It's a fantastic training um, that, that goes over tourniquets, quick clot, and, and showing what to do in these situations. So I urge you to, to look it up. Um, and if anyone is interested in it and needs assistance, we can, we can help you uh, get in touch with the class that's coming up with that. Um, but fantastic class. I highly recommend it for anyone. And then anyone going through this event um, is going to experience shock, survivor's guilt, PTSD, nightmares. And we recommend that everybody go through at least you know, one private counseling session. Um, and people that aren't affected by this, weren't on scene, sometimes go through some of this. So knowing that, th that that's a normal uh, situation and dealing with that is important. Don't be afraid to reach out and uh, you know, talk with somebody. And if you notice here today, uh, we haven't named any of these attackers. Um, the names of these shooters um, being left out is intentional on our behalf. We know that some of the shooters are motivated and desired the notoriety. They were nothings in their lives, but committing mass murder was their way of trying to become something and become famous. So why do we give them why should we give them that, that notoriety? So please you know, pass that message on with us. Does anyone know who this is? All right, so if, for you that don't recognize her, this is Victoria Soto. She was the first grade teacher at Sandy Hook who saved the lives of her students and countless, uh, countless students that day and Many of us here probably could think of the name of the attacker. Um, that's what's on the news, that's what's on the media. And she put herself between the monster saving her children and uh, she was just a heroic young woman. All right. And this one, her name's Angela McQueen. She was a math teacher in Illinois and phys ed teacher in Illinois, math and phys ed, and a shooter came, came into her classroom and she immediately attacked the shooter, knocking him to the ground, disarming him, and holding him down until law enforcement arrived. This story got almost no uh, publicity on the news. No one was injured, it was over, um, and she saved all of her students that day. This is the people that we like to, to look at you know, as the heroes of, of knowing in these situations. I'm going to pass it back over to the chief for the summary here. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jeff. Before we get into the summary, I don't know how many people here came tonight to talk about concealed carry or hit me with a question about concealed carry. Uh, I usually, when I get that, I don't like to answer a question with a question, but I usually fr tell the people, it's like, if you're carrying a firearm, and you feel you can effectively use it, that's a decision that you have to make. I think there's a lot of things you need to take into uh, consideration. Is your mindset, is, are you mentally prepared to deal with the aftermath of that? Are you financially prepared to deal with the aftermath? If you accidentally shoot the wrong person, if you miss and hit an innocent person, there's a lot of things that need to be taken into consideration. Um, but I also realize there's a lot of people that carry firearms, especially in Wyoming County, and we're not coming immediately. So sometimes you might be the help that we need. Um, 
I recommend you have some kind of, if you're going to carry and you think that you're going to put yourself in one of these situations and you are mentally prepared and you train, um, you know, you train moving targets, you just don't go shoot cans off of a wall, you're proficient at dealing at a high stress rate and moving and doing all those things, then maybe you have some type of uh, uh, personal liability in case there is an accident if you do shoot somebody or you get sued civilly. Even if you shoot a bad guy, there's nothing that says that that family now can't come after you, all right? You have a lot less protections than I have as a police officer. So I like to say that before we get into our summary. So we know the definition of an active shooter event. We talked about disaster response in the three phases. Avoid, deny, defend. Again, I think a pretty simple concept. It's a little tweak of the words. I'm not going to stand here and tell you this is the way. It is a way. If you like run, hide, fight, use run, hide, fight. If you like this, use that. I, if you like both, kind of put them together. Just have a plan, think about these things, rehearse them. Um, not having a plan is planning to fail. That's Benjamin Franklin's words, okay? Simple concept, just think it through. You know, next time you go to church, next time you go to work, next time you're in the school, look at your exits, what would you do if somebody came in? You know, it seems very simple to me as a police officer because I do it every day, I do it everywhere I take my family. I tell my wife, hey, if something goes wrong at this concert, that's the main exit, we're going this way. That's our back out because everybody's going to want to go that way and you know, she might think I'm nuts, but I hope we're on to something. Just think about it. It doesn't take long. Rehearse these things. And then the big one is that Virginia t uh, case study, Virginia Tech, uh, we saw how having that plan works, doing something works, what you do matters, all right? Everybody in this room has the right to go home and you need to do what you need to do. So think about these things, have a plan and ultimately it should you know, help save your life. Uh, at that point, this concludes the presentation. Um, we can try to field any questions if you guys have them. And if not, if you don't want to ask in front of everybody, we'll kind of be hanging out. So come up and ask a question if you need to. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I'd just like to end by thanking the community for coming out for this event. Um, I think it's very important that's why we sponsored it. Thank you very much to the Tunkhannock Area School Board. Thank you to the superintendent and all the staff. Uh, I praise them because they are extremely proactive safety and security for the school district. And we are, going, we are trying to pass that on to the community. Okay, Tunkhannock Area School District is our community. Okay, and that's what we strive to do. I hope the superintendent doesn't mind me saying, but I plan on in the spring holding another forum for the community for reunification of our students in the event that we have to evacuate the school district. Okay, which could happen. I have a plan for that, but I want to present it to the community and the community members teachers, parents, grandparents, guardians, so that in the case that we ever do have to notify you that we are reunifying your students, you know how the process works. So look forward to that coming up in a few months from now. But thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, thank you.